Uh, today I'm going to talk about Jupiter, uh, but I'm going to mention what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to do a bunch of whiz-bang things showing you uh, fancy graphs or whatever uh, and all that. I'm going to show you about Jupiter so you know what Jupiter is, where it's coming from, how the pieces fit together, and uh, even more important, uh, uh, show you how to identify what you would like from a tool like this because we here at SharkNet want this feedback so we can set up an ideal uh, set of environments so that a tool like Jupyter can be used effectively to do research, uh, to process your research data, explore what your data means and all of this stuff. It's a wonderful tool. If you've already used the SharkNet visualization workstations, what you'll find once you start exploring Jupyter is that you're using a web browser and a web interface. So the traditional way of logging in through SSH and using Jupyter is actually not the main way of using Jupyter. The main way of using Jupyter is through the web. Now currently, SharkNet, we don't have Jupyter set up uh, just yet. Uh, but that's why it's very important uh, you give us feedback and you say, oh, we want to do this kind of thing, or we really like this library that I saw on the web, and you can let us know all of this. I'll say it again later. But you can let us know all of this through help at sharknet.ca or directly contact me or any of the uh, SharkNet uh, staff for it, and we will take note of it and uh, work with uh, everyone to get the best possible environment so we can help enable everyone's research. Jupyter is a very unique tool, a very cool tool. Okay, so I'm going to go over a little bit of an overview. Uh, how to install it. Now, uh, the current setup on one of the SharkNet machines for Jupyter has some issues, so I'm not going to worry about showing you that right now. Instead, I'm going to show you how to install it on your own machine and make use of it. And I'm going to show you some places on the web where you can try things out and more importantly, check out what others have done and you can see what was done and then say, hmm, I'm interested in this. This is the kind of thing I'd like to have. And if so, then you can let us know and we will set it up with SharkNet. Additional things that we here at SharkNet are doing behind the scenes is we're looking at all the setup details and one of the issues, of course, is you have disk space in different locations and you'd like these to be available for you in Jupyter because, hey, your data set's sitting in SharkNet disk space. And how do you share that with your research team and stuff like this? So it's these kind of logistics behind the scenes uh, that we are also worrying about right now because next year we get new hardware and there will be uh, increase, an increasing number of nodes dedicated to cloud type tasks. And some of the cloud type tasks uh, are related to Jupyter. If you're interested in Hadoop and Spark and stuff, you can use those from within Jupyter as well. So it's a very cool tool, very powerful tool. Jupyter itself, is re it's new. I'll put it in a nutshell, it's new. So when, uh, my instructions on how to install it uh, was after uh, looking at a variety of ways of going about installing it. And I took the simplest and easiest one that will give you a working configuration. Uh, Jupyter is new enough that uh, uh, a variety of tools for Jupyter uh, uh, don't even, uh, aren't even at version one yet. That's okay. It's extremely useful, and it does work very well, but a number of tools aren't even at version 1 yet. So uh, it's a spin-off of something called IPython, which started with Python. If you're familiar with the Python programming language, great. That's, that's where IPython was born from. And uh, IPython still exists. It's not obsolete, uh, but it, it exists as a shell and a little kernel module that uh, gives the core of the power of what Jupyter has to Jupyter. You can think of Jupyter as a bigger project uh, that provides a web interface to the IPython and other uh, features that are there. And Jupyter itself is a project just like IPython is actually a project. And there's a bunch of applications for it. And the most common one that everyone sees when they use either one is called Notebook. And that's the dominant thing of what I'll be talking about today, but I'm going to talk about some of the other components. 
IPython itself was released back in 2001. And very importantly, it's a command line shell, but it enables interactive computing. So you can, if you've ever used Waterloo Maple to do mathematical calculations, uh, you know exactly what IPython notebook does. And this is what Jupyter Notebook does, except it's not one language. So what does that mean? Well, you type something, and you can run it, and you can see the output. And you type something, and you run it, and see the output. And it numbers all the lines for you, and you can see it all as one big screen. Uh, like word processing document, but it's uh, a web page, and uh, you can do stuff. Now, IPython started out, uh, it was just a window, and Jupyter took that to the next level, uh, incorporating the web and a variety of other technologies. Now, uh, Jupyter itself and IPython are used for data science and data analysis, exploratory or more hardcore. Uh, I'll put it this way. If you use Python for anything, as long as those Python libraries are installed, you can do it. So if you're, I don't know, you're on your own computer, but you uh, do CUDA programming with Python, well, you'd be able to use uh, PyCUDA, the CUDA library for uh, with Python um, with Jupyter because the main language in Jupyter and in IPython is Python, but it's not the only language. Okay. Jupyter Notebook is the most commonly used Jupyter project, the most well-known. It's basically what everyone interacts with, thinks they're interacting with. It allows you to make uh, an interactive, shareable document, and you'll be seeing an example. I'll be showing this after. Uh, and live code visualizations and text can go into it. You can put Markdown in it. You can put HTML. You can have, uh, in, if the extension's installed, you can put LaTeX in it. So you can basically have a document that has normal document things as well as code, and the code is executable. But if you only had a viewer and you didn't have all the doodads installed and somebody shared the document with you, you can actually see all the output because when they saved it, it saves a cache copy of the output. So you're all set. So this is pretty cool. Okay, so big data, machine learning, data cleaning and transformation, parallel backends. Uh, you can interchange data across programming languages in it. Uh, data science, statistical modeling. Uh, these are the uses for Jupyter Notebook. Uh, a nice tool, this is something you won't install yourself, but it's good to know about it. Let's say you did some data analyses and stuff, and now you have published work, and you want to share that with others. Uh, not just your research group, like with others, the public, the Internet. Uh, there is a Jupyter project called MB Viewer, which means Notebook Viewer, and that's like a website where you can see the notebook, but everything in it is not interactive. So whatever you did, however you saved that notebook, is how others are going to see it. And that's a wonderful way to share uh, research with others on the web. And there is a website that the Jupyter Project has set up, and I'm going to go there and show you uh, things there so you can get an idea, hey, what can I do with Jupyter? And you can get an idea looking at it, but you'll see, hey, we can't interact with this. Yes, uh, there are other... Uh, uh, you can run Jupyter yourself, or there are two tools that you can interact with Jupyter on. And so it's good to know that this exists, because when a research project is done, uh, you may want to have on your website a link to, hey, this, is, this shows our analysis of the data, and here's the graphs, and things like that. Just because it's not interactive uh, doesn't mean there isn't any interaction. If you used interactive... Uh, the Python libraries that have interactive graphs, those graphs will still be interactive, but nothing will be saved. Nothing gets modified. It's, it's read-only, but you can, uh, people can interact with the graph. There's another Jupyter uh, project called Temporary Notebook. Now, if you've ever been yourself to try.jupyter.org, Although right now, I think all Python notebooks are in use, so you can't look at it, uh, but be able to try it out after again. Um, this 
is running temporary notebook. The idea here is you want to post your stuff that allow people to interact with it. And then after, a, a, let's say, 10 minutes of inactivity, they don't do anything, uh, it gets deleted. So basically, it's like the, it's like Jupyter Notebook, but you can try things, you can do things. And, uh, on the other hand, you can't save them. Uh, so it's useful, uh, to have, uh, to let people try out stuff or to learn from or whatever, or let's say you have trouble installing on your own computer and you want to learn a little bit of Jupyter, you can go to try.jupyter.org to do that. Now, Jupyter Hub, this is something uh, that is ideal. It's a multi-user way of doing these Jupyter notebooks. Uh, it's authenticated, and uh, it is uh, for multi-user uh, document creation, editing, and sharing via the web. So like your research team, and you'd be able to, your research team could have a bunch of Jupyter documents, and you could share them all together using Jupyter Hub. Nicely, Jupyter Hub also lets you have like local, that's only your disk space, as well as shared disk space. There's a way of doing that behind the scenes. So Jupyter Hub is something that, uh, as we investigate things, uh, SharpNet's exploring, should we be running it, and how should we set it up properly, and with what Python libraries does everyone want, so you be able to use Jupyter. So, uh, this has already been explored uh, in Compute Canada to some extent, and it's starting to be used. Uh, and as we uh, explore here at SharkNet, we want to have a nice uh, configuration running so that everyone can do, everyone that can log into SharkNet can make use of Jupyter for their research purposes. Now, installing Jupyter. Uh, in a nutshell, the easiest way of all the things I tried is to install Miniconda. And the reason I say Miniconda versus Anaconda, some of you might have heard of Anaconda, is that Miniconda uh, is a miniature version of Anaconda, but allows you to install multiple versions of Python. And some legacy libraries need Python 2, and some uh, uh, and most of the newer libraries and the ones that are in legacy libraries updated are using Python 3. So uh, that's an issue. So Miniconda is the way to go there. Uh, also, you might have uh, a need to run stuff and some libraries have to remain at a certain version or they get broken. Or another use of using Miniconda is if you have to leave your analysis set up, all the software installed for it, alone and not touch it, what you can do with Miniconda is create an environment. So you could say, uh, you can make a special research environment called special, and you just don't want to touch it once it's installed. You can do that with Miniconda, and you won't have to break your environment or something if you upgrade other environments. So it's kind of cool that you can do that. It's also by far the easiest way to install Jupyter on your own machine. So to install it, you can go to that URL there, or you can just type Miniconda space Python in Google, and I believe it's the first link that you'll get. Okay, and on the page that comes up, that page that I have there, you will be able to download the installer for your operating system. If you have Windows, read the instructions. If you have a Mac or Linux, you can open the command line and simply run sh space and the name of that file that you downloaded, uh, and it will install it. And at the very end of the, I won't do that because it takes a little bit of time to download everything, but uh, at the very end of it, it will ask if you want to modify your bash rc file on Linux and Mac machines. Uh, if you do, fine. Uh, you will have to source your bash RC or just log out and log back in, and you will be able to use Miniconda. If you don't save the output of that command, if you don't save it to your bash RC, save the output. The, it's an export path equals line. Save that line in a text file. You'll need to run that in a shell in order to use Miniconda. Okay. The command there is the export path line you see. Uh, and after you have it installed, you only have to do this once. If you need a Python 2 environment, that conduct create command will do that. If you need a Python 3 environment, that 
uh, conduct, second conduct create command will do that. Now the dash n thing says I'm giving the name. So py, py2 is the name of the Python 2 environment and py3 is the name of the Python 3 environment. Uh, the anaconda after it tells conda to install the anaconda package. So you're using miniconda to install anaconda, and in this case you're installing it twice. But nicely this gives you a Python 2 and a Python 3 package, because some of the Python libraries that you might use for your research uh, might not have been updated to Python 3 yet. So this is the easiest way to get both. Okay. Now in order to use them, all you do is go source, activate, and the name you gave it. So Pi2 for Python 2, or source, activate, and Pi3. It's kind of cool. And in, when you're done with it in the terminal window, you can go source, deactivate, and it'll unload the Conda environment. Okay. Now, this Conda installation works even if you already have your own Python installation installed and gobbledygook. Okay. Uh, so uh, that's a wonderful thing. So you don't have to worry about messing up your environment. You don't have to be super user. In fact, don't be super user. You can run this completely in your own user account uh, without any issues. Uh, if you use, uh, if you go on some websites, it'll talk about some of them talk about using pip and some of these other tools. Pip is P-I-P. Uh, don't use those. You've got to be super user, and they'll probably mess up your system in other regards. Uh, using Anaconda and or Miniconda is the way to go. Okay. Now, very briefly, you'll see me run Jupyter Notebook in a sec. I'll be doing a demonstration. But Jupyter, when you uh, go run Jupyter Notebook, understand Notebook's an application. And when you run Jupyter Notebook, it fires up a web server on your own machine. Okay? So that web server runs, and then you, uh, it, it, if it's first time you're running it, then on your machine, and there's nothing already running, it will fire up the web browser nicely too. You'll be able to go to it. I'll show you how that works, and I'll show you how it works between the two just so you understand how that works. Uh, and when you're done, you need to shut, not just close your web browser, but you got to shut down the web server that's running. And the easiest way to do that is to hit Control C twice. The first time it asks you a question, you can answer yes or no. You have five seconds, uh, or you can just hit Control C again, and it goes. Get shut down. Now. Uh, this last slide here, and I'm going to do demonstration, but there are many useful libraries. There's lots of libraries today for Python. But these are some of the most important libraries that people doing data science and exploratory data research and statistical analysis uh, are using with Python uh, and uh, Jupyter Notebook. So mat matplotlib is pretty much standard. The very first import you do is uh, uh, matplotlib. Uh, Pandas is a uh, wonderful data analysis library. Uh, and if you, uh, uh, Pandas is commonly used because it can import from a, a number of input formats, comma separated value, of course. But a lot of people have research in Excel spreadsheets. So, you know, you might have downloaded your research even and done a lot of work in Excel spreadsheet or your tool exports to Excel spreadsheet. This will load the Excel spreadsheet as well. So that's really cool. Uh, but there are very cool data analysis things. And Pandas makes it really easy to for your data frame, which is like your spreadsheet, if you will, of your data, uh, to add more columns, to do some data cleaning, uh, and uh, hide rows, rows, change things in them, etc. Uh, Scikit-learn is used in the machine learning world. Uh, Seaborn uh, is a, a statistical package and has a variety of visualization tools, very nice ones. Uh, and uh, stats model is more hardcore statistics, but it is for just for that hardcore statistics where it outputs a lot more statistical data. Its focus is less on graphics and more on the uh, statistics. Uh, so that's how those are used. I should mention some other things. Uh, I'm going to go to the web in a sec, and you'll see some of these things. But with Jupyter, uh, Python is the front end. But you, you're not restricted to Python. 
Jupiter now uh, has uh, projects supporting approximately 40 different languages. So uh, the most mature of those uh, other languages would be uh, R. So if you are a big time R user, uh, you can use R with Jupyter Notebook. You can use it. And you can even have variables in Python move the data into R call an R function from, you know, from Python, uh, passing the data variables, and then get the output and then continue doing Python work. You can also do R stuff exclusively and things like that. So I want to point this out, but it's way too much for one one hour intro. So this is an intro. Uh, and we'll have to have future presentations and online materials showing you specifics going into, uh, say, a specific library or, hey, let's do things with R and things like that. If you go to jupiter.org, that's the Jupiter website. Notice it's with a Y, not an I. So Jupiter the planet changed the uh, I to a Y. And if you're wondering why, think Python, P-Y, right? It's, a lot of things with Python get the P-Y in their name. So Jupiter is with a Y. And this is the website. The doc, all important documentation is here. Okay, and they have widgets, they have project community things. You can see over 40 languages. They got a nice little summary here. I encourage you to read, at least scan through this stuff so you are aware of some of the things. Uh, there are widgets that are interactive. Uh, there are, and you'll see some of them. Uh, if you are doing Hadoop, Spark, etc. Uh, there is big data in integration that includes with Scala. If you are, if you like Ruby, there are, there's Ruby notebooks. Okay. Uh, they have try it in your browser, install the notebook, and many companies are using it. It is a software carpentry, which Sharknet also supports, but a software carpentry, uh, supported initiative for tutorials. And lots and lots of stuff. Something for everyone. Now, that's overall what Jupyter is. Uh, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to go to the MV Viewer. If you click this link, MV Viewer, it will take you to uh, Jupyter's MV Viewer website. And this is a site to share notebooks. Now, a notebook is just like a Word file. You know, you use a word processor and you save it and you get your uh, .docx or .doc file. That's what a notebook is. The extension is a little bit strange, IPYNB, that just means IPython notebook, but it's, it's a file. And everything you do in a notebook, it gets saved in the file, which is really nice. So this website showcases files that people have made available. Now, without even going into anything, you can see that, uh, you know, they're featuring iRuby, notebook, which allows you to do Ruby inside of Jupyter. They got Julia, which is a new uh, high performance computing uh, language. Uh, and there's a Julia notebook. There's IPython, which is the basics of the basics. Uh, but some of you will be more interested in signal processing. This one is cool. If you're into uh, the social networking type of research, Mining the Social Web is an O'Reilly book, and in this, they have a series, this book has a series of notebooks. So this Mining Twitter notebook, this site is read only, but this Mining Twitter notebook uh, shows you uh, how to go about mining Twitter. In fact, even explains how to do that in these comments. So this is very useful because if your research involves uh, uh, pulling down stuff from the web and analyzing Twitter trends and all of these things. This is a, this, this is a real notebook that you could use to do that. You can even download these notebooks. This icon at the top right, uh, if you click on it and you see this, don't worry. This is a, a JSON file. And uh, just go back and right click and choose Save Link As in your browser and you will be able to save it to your hard drive and use it. Obviously, you'll have to have Jupyter installed along with any of the software tools needed. Uh, but uh, for this book, at least in chapter one, it probably only needs IPython notebooks, so these examples will actually work. Uh, 
there are other things here. Uh, let's just take a look at some interesting tools. Lightning is a, a, a new tool, and it makes use of a variety of things. Uh, Node.js with the NPM uh, set of codes, uh, 3.js, and D3.js. D3.js is a scientific, uh, it's a plotting uh, tool, tool for JavaScript. It's commonly used on web pages. Now, uh, what this is showcasing is, is if you're using this lightning tool, then uh, you, this is what you, this here at the top right here is Python code. Okay, so if you've never seen Python code, this little bit is here. If you use Waterloo Maple, you would have seen uh, there's numbers on the side here and, uh, when you use Waterloo Maple. The same thing happens in Jupyter. So uh, the code elements here have numbering and uh, you can see that. So if this code is run, that brings in a bunch of libraries. And then the next line here, okay, initializes lightning. Okay, which is a library. And uh, then here we initialize some points. So if we go up here, we can see uh, we, uh, from uh, NumPy, which is a very commonly used uh, Python library for numerical uh, processing in Python, we're using random. So we come down here at random.randn. We choose a couple of uh, random numbers. We want n points. Okay, so we have 100x and 100y points, and let's do a scatter plot. Now with Lightning, you know, if this was a normal program, uh, you wouldn't be able to do anything. You'd see a static plot, but uh, with Lightning, you get this interactive element, and you can see I'm already moving this around with my mouse to do it slow enough so you can see it. If I use my mouse wheel, I can zoom in and I can zoom out. So even though this is a read-only thing, I can't do anything more in this, it's read-only, uh, I can still interact with it on the web page because this is provided to the web browser. And I can double-click on a point and it will tell me the value of that point. That's pretty cool. You can have bigger points. You can set colors. Okay, Drag this around and resize it. There's styling options. So you can say, oh, you want to do tints and stuff like that. So here we go, and you can see those points. It keeps scaling up. Now, the nice thing about this NB Viewer site is that you see example after example after example. So you can find things you like, and the code that's needed to do it is on that page, too. So the good thing is, is you can find things you like or you might want to do, and now you have a piece of code to refer to. And if you're stuck, there's help at sharknet.ca. We can help you with that. And if you want that library available somewhere on Sharknet so you can use it better or one way or another use it, we can help you go about doing that. So you can have different colors. Uh, you can, these are all just scatter plots. And we can keep going through, seeing example after example. And those are just plots, OK? Uh, but you're interested in bar charts you can go to the bar chart thing. You have to wait a second here for it to generate. OK, so it generated random values. And here is bar charts with numbers in them, things like that. So very, very cool. Uh, you can do different things. There's support for 3D and other forms of interaction, such as vertices. You have to give it a moment to generate. It's using a public server to generate the graph. Here we go. We have some graphs here. Um, some of these won't be as interacted, act, interactable because they are on the MB Viewer site. But as you can see here, even on the web in read-only mode, we can see what's connected to each vertice, vertex by double-clicking it. So this is very useful. So that's just this is stuff right on the NB Viewer website to explore. Uh, you know, if you do vision research, you are interested in statistics, you can see stuff in here, et cetera, et cetera. Now, uh, one of the areas to start is in the IPython notebook because uh, they show you how things can be run. Uh, and if you have problems using this, 
no problem. Uh, help at sharptech.ca and we can help you. Uh, and there are books and tutorials and we will have more stuff on our own websites in it. So let's say you're interested in plotting in the notebook. You can click on it and this shows you how to use Matplotlib. Okay, and if you write this line at the top, okay, then you can go about using Matplotlib and you can do stuff like this. So just these five lines along with this matplotlib here. So these lines here will give you this output. Okay. And then they show you how you can do more with it. Some of the examples get really complicated quick. Okay. I advise at first to keep all of your examples simple. In fact, for fun, why don't we just try out this example? I have Jupyter installed. So we'll try it out. Okay, so let's make this window a little bit smaller. And let's bring over the command window. Okay, so I already have my Conda environment set up. And what I'm going to do is source activate I2. And when I do that, it changes my command prompt to have pi2 in it. If I do source deactivate, it takes that away. So if I want the pi3 environment, I source activate pi3 and I have Python 3. Okay. And you can see that when you run Python. Notice this is 352. Okay. Uh, if I source deactivate, Okay, and do the pi2 activate, and I run Python, I have pi2.7 now. Now, just to prove to you, you can also have a version of Python already installed. I do. Okay, on my system, I deactivated everything, but if I run Python, okay, uh, actually, because I have the Conda stuff set up, it's showing the Conda stuff, but if I open another window, Okay, and I run Python here, you will see I have yet another version of Python. So the nice thing about that miniconda command for installing stuff is you don't have to worry what's on your system uh, because you won't mess that up. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll go back to the Python 2 environment. And now to run Jupyter Notebook, I will run Jupyter Notebook. Now this will start up a web browser. Okay, so I'm going to move this. I got another window right here. Paste the URL. It does start the web browser, but I want to use a different window. There we go. And the first time you run Jupyter Notebook, we'll bring this over. There won't be much in it. Now, the thing to know about Jupyter Notebook is that it starts up in the directory you started it in. And I was in the Jupyter Notebooks directory. So uh, there's nothing in this directory, so I don't see anything. Okay. If I go over here to the side, though, you can see that I have Python 2 and Python 3. Now, it looks like Conda uh, sets up both when you install uh, the IPython stuff, and you put in Anaconda and all that, you put the, it sets up both, so we can actually go into both. But I'm going to choose the Python 2 notebook, and I'm going to show you that this is Python 2. I'm going to go print 2 plus 3. There we go. It's Python 2. So notice on the side here, at the top right, it says Py2. Okay. And uh, it says unsaved changes. So that means if I close my browser right now, I don't have anything. The word untitled, when you move on top of it, uh, highlights. If I click it, I can give it my name. I can say my first Python 2 notebook. Okay, Jupyter Notebook. Long name. I don't advise giving it a really long name like that unless you want. But there we go. There we have the name. Okay. You can say save and checkpoint. Uh, you can download it. You can have it. Uh, download as HTML or as a PDF, things like this. Uh, so it's very nice. Okay, but I'm 
I have this running. Now, over here in this window, when I was doing all of this, when I ran Jupyter Notebook right here, okay, you might see some messages, but then you're going to see the Jupyter Notebook is running at a web address. This is the web address you want to go to in your web browser. So if a browser doesn't open up, that's how you would go to it. Okay. Now, it, it makes your notebooks. Okay. So now I have this page here. If I go back to it, okay, there's a file in this directory. And I'll even open up another window here. If we go here, there's a file. My first Python 2 Jupyter Notebook is the file name. So I see it's running here. Okay, well, hey, I could start another notebook, Python 3 notebook. Okay, now if I type in the Python 2 code for print, that's not going to work. Okay, now when you type in code, if you hit enter, it does that, normal enter. You have to hit shift enter to run it. Okay, that's illegal Python Two code for Python uh, or Python three. For Python three, you need to have round brackets, and so when you do that, you'll get things. So you can do Python programming in here, and you can do that. Now, if I go back to here, I can see that both notebooks are running. I didn't give a name for the Python three one, so let's do that. So we have a name. We'll call it Py three, and we'll save it. Okay. Now we have Py three. Notebook. So we have these two files and they're both running. Now if I go running, I can see that they're running here and I can even shut them down. Okay? And if you have a back end that's clusters, then you'll be able to see cluster stuff. Okay? And there's the conda back end. So now if I go here and let's just say for some reason I uh, accidentally close my browser. Okay? So I'm going to close this window leave everything. Boom. Oh my god, what do I do? I closed everything. Uh, all is not lost as long as this web server is running here. So when we ran Jupyter Notebook, as long as this window stays open, we're good and the web server is running. That's the URL we want to go to. So if I open up uh, a window and I paste the URL in, there it is, and I hit enter, everything's still running. Okay. Now what does that mean? Well, for fun here, let's go to these files. So if I go to this file, okay, everything's still running. Okay, well, let's set a variable to four. Okay. And if I close this window, okay, well, I might not, uh, if I close this window without saving and it says unsave changes, that would be bad because if I do this and I go back, I don't remember which one I clicked on. There we go, 84. I guess I got it saved. Great. Always remember to save. There's a save icon. Okay, you're good. Now, if for some reason you choose close and halt or you go to that other screen and you stop it from running, notice it's gray now. It's not running anymore. Okay. Well, what does that mean? That means it's not running anymore. When you go back into it and you look at it, yes, it will remember all your outputs. But uh, if you said right here, print A, and you went to output it, there's a problem. It doesn't know what A is. Why? Because you've got to rerun everything from the top of the file all the way down. Okay, And you can do that up here with the uh, run this will run the code in the cell and select and go to the next. And when you do that, you can do that. Uh, get the output again. So the idea of a notebook is you start at the top, you go to the bottom. And you put code in it and you can put text in it too. So right here, uh, I might want to split this cell. So uh, the, uh, sorry, insert. I might want to have a cell above it. So if I put a cell above it, and I might want to write some text. This is some text. Or how about heading? A heading would be really good here. And I said I can use markdown, but right now it thinks it's code. What you do is you come up here and you choose markdown. Okay, and this is markdown. And when you click out of it, okay, uh, it should be doing markdown. There we go. And when you go out of it, it will be markdown text. Okay? 
you it by out of the box it supports Markdown, and uh, other features can be added like you, there's HTML support and things like that. So you can put descriptive headings for everything you do. So you can have text and you can have graphs. Okay. So this is really cool. Now, if for some reason you accidentally close the window or you hit Control C twice here and you shut down your server, okay? Now, Jupyter, the web browser, can't talk to the server anymore, okay? So that's a problem, okay? Because if you try to do something here, like print A again, it's not going to be able to do anything. There's an error, and it says connecting the kernel error. So you do not want to accidentally shut down your little web server for Jupyter. If I run it again, it'll be able to run, okay, uh, and you'll probably want to refresh your page. Uh, you will lose what's on that page, and then you just rerun all your cells, and then you will get your output. Okay, the other way of shutting down Jupyter is right here. Now, this is a base install of Jupyter. You can install R notebooks and other notebooks for other languages like Scala and all that. They will appear in this pull-down menu. Inside of Jupyter, if I make another notebook, I can actually put shell commands. So I can put uh, exclamation mark ls and run it, and I can see what's in my directory. So it's a, an extremely powerful tool. We don't have time to go into all of these things that you can do in it, but I did say earlier, let's try this matplotlib. Okay, so the first line we have here is this. I'm just going to copy and paste it. We could save the notebook, but let's just actually paste it. So we'll put that in. Okay, you will sometimes get a warning message. Most of the time they don't matter, but sometimes they do. Um, in this case, it's just about uh, building my font cache. So now if I paste this in here, there, I need that. And now let's just try this and see what it will do. There we go. So now we have this graph. So then you say, oh, what can we do with it? Well, we're using matplotlib. So for matplotlib, it's a wise idea when you're using a library to go to the website for that library. And I got it somewhere right here, matplotlib. Okay, so this is matplotlib, and they have examples. They also have a gallery. So they show you how features, you can check out these examples, okay? And the gallery will show you various graphs and stuff. So if you're unsure, but you want to do data analysis, and you want a tool that's interactive where you can type some lines, see a graph, see some output, and some of them even are animated, and you can move things around and all that to explore them. Uh, and, oh my god, what do we use? Well, these websites for these tools have galleries in that, so you can click on it. So if you're interested in statistical plots, the matplotlib site has them here. Let's make this bigger. Or the bitmaps aren't any bigger. Okay. But you can see right here we have statistical plots with bars and things like this. Uh, there are violin plots. There are all kinds of plots you can do. Uh, this is wonderful because you can take something that gets output like this and you can actually save it. Okay. So you can download it. You can save the picture. Most of the time when you do your figures, uh, you can run a command like plot and uh, bring up, uh, oops, the wrong one, uh, and find uh, the save option so you can save it. Uh, I think it starts with save for matplotlib, all the way down. I hit tab, if you hit tab, it, you can complete. Save fig right here, save fig. So you can give it a file name, uh, how about chirp.png. So if we do that and hit enter, that saved it. And if we go back here, there's chirp PNG. We should be able to click on it. I don't know why we don't see anything. Uh, maybe we have to just rerun the code. I'll restart the page and rerun everything in it. And hopefully we can see it update. Should have saved it. 
unless we have to be in the same cell. It's a little strange. One more time. There we go. It has to be in the same cell. So uh, there we go. We have a saved image of our graph. And of course, you can change all the settings for this. So it gives you an idea, a very, very tiny idea of what Jupyter can do. Uh, the libraries, NumT is a must. SciP is a must for many research purposes. But there's Matplotlib. I encourage you to go to these websites and look at the galleries. Uh, Pandas is a wonderful, extensive tool set uh, for it. There are books on it. This is an excellent book, Python for Data Analysis. Uh, and if you go to documentation under Pandas, uh, you can see tutorials and you can see cookbook. Okay, And the cookbook will show you examples. You can just type in your code. So uh, if you do the import on the Pandas line, these these code fragments will work. You'll be able to type this stuff in and they will work. So it's a good way to explore stuff. Scikit-learn is for machine learning. You can see graphs like this. So if you have interest in classification, regression, clustering, blah, 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 there you go. You have a wonderful tool set available to explore and check out. Again, there are many examples to look at. Uh, so that may be more useful. Seaborn uh, is an, uh, for visualizing statistics, and it is very nice. Again, they have a gallery, so go through, look at the gallery, see things you like, uh, and if, they're, if you like it a lot, then mention it. Here's a violin plot, for example. Okay, so you can get outputs like this, and then you have Python code. So if you do this, actually, if you put all of this code into a Jupyter notebook you will be able to see this output. Um, the only problem is, is you need to load a data set. So you have to get that data set. Uh, in many cases, some of these data sets come with the libraries when they get installed. Uh, and in statistical models, including ordinary least squares, kernel density estimators, and things like this. So this is more hardcore statistics. So I'm at the end of our hour. I don't want to overdo it. I scaled back what I was originally going to do is I wanted to point out these sites so you could explore them. The links will be appear in the video and, of course, in the slides online. Uh, and so you can look at them and explore these websites, figure out the kinds of things you like. If you find other Jupyter-related websites, uh, by all means, bring those to our attention because right now we're actively looking at how can we help researchers use a, use a tool like this and more importantly, not just use a single researchers or single students. We would like research teams to be able to work together. And for that, we need a nice little cloud setup on our SharkNet systems for Jupyter. I'll leave it at that. Thank you.